Oh, I'm so, so happy and excited to have one of my favorite people here, Jonathan Nelson. He's such a beautiful, beautiful man. I met him a few years ago um, at a chakra training event in the States and immediately I loved him. He just felt like a soul brother and um, and he's uh, the partner of my dear friend, Anadea Judith. And I just love him so much and have so much respect for the embodiment of the divine masculine and his love of the goddess is so pure and so true and so beautiful. And Jonathan is an artist, a beautiful artist. Um, and he's had many, many things that he's done in his life which is one of them is actually being a Lutheran minister, which is is pretty profoundly interesting to me. He's a mystic. He's a seeker. And um, he loves to bring the world religion in the embodiment of that um, in honoring and reverence to the divine that's within. And so, Jonathan, I'm so happy for you to be joining in on this summit. Thank you. You are welcome. It's an honor. It really is. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. Yeah. I kept thinking about Jonathan. I was like, oh, Jonathan just has to be part of this summit. I mean, I feel like Jonathan, you embody not just the divine masculine, but the divine feminine too, like in a really beautiful and profound way. Like I remember mm -hmm. dancing with you and you had the same like beautiful pants on that Anadea has and yeah we have matching pants for dance <laughs> I love that I love that so much yeah and you're well so and there um if if I'm remembering correctly those are the the pants that are like the night the night sky and uh I'm an amateur astronomer and I love the cosmos and the heavens and they get lost up there at night yeah yeah thank you for thank you for reminding me about that because you painted mm. this incredible mural of the cosmos um in your backyard because i remember those pictures and it's so beautiful yeah so you're well for a summer solstice uh a year and a half ago we had a big gathering and um oh we had a theatrical production of uh on the theme of a midsummer night's dream and mm, about a month before that, uh, we had had this concrete pad poured, but not painted, not decorated. So I told Anna Dale, let's paint a giant galaxy, spiral galaxy on it. So we did. We got up at five in the morning and got out there just as the sun was coming up uh, for several weeks and painted this thing. And we love it. People love it. And it's just a great big spiral grand galaxy out there in our backyard that people dance on. <laughs> it's amazing. That's a dance floor. <laughs> yeah, I love that. <laughs> yeah, I love that you have a galaxy that you dance on in your backyard. Mm. How cool is that? <laughs> and your your artwork behind you is one of your beautiful paintings, too. Yeah. So yeah, this is actually a um, mural that I painted for some clients years back. Uh, Erica and Julie, a couple uh, great friends of mine, and they actually moved to Spain. So they gave the mural back to me and said, sell it if you can, or just keep it. And so there it is. Oh, I love the colors. It's really beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So is it on panels of wood? It's actually on doors. Uh, they were closet doors uh, for Erica's a uh, high fashion closet wow. and uh, and you know i said i'll send you the money if i sell it and they said no keep the money or send us half and so several people have been interested in it but it, right now it sits in our home as a backdrop for you folks <laughs> that's wonderful oh <laughs> <laughs> So, um, Jonathan, my first question for you is, what does the goddess mean to you? Mm. Big question. So, 
I'm fortunate to have grown up in a family where I have three sisters and a mom who are all powerful women and accomplished, intelligent women. And so I'm fortunate to have had goddess training from the very start. I had close relationships with my two grandmas and um, I learned from an old fashioned dad, an old fashioned conservative dad to honor and respect women. And so I've never felt anything different other than women are to be cherished and adored and that they are goddesses. And I learned later in life what goddess religions are. And so Aphrodite and Ishtar and so many wonderful, glorious goddesses have, um, you know, I, th I think rounded out my understanding of the goddess. I'm, I'm partnered with a goddess. So um, I serve her. And a lot of men don't have the kind of training and kind of background I have. They aren't fortunate that way. So our culture in the United States teaches a very different kind of culture, you know, around um, women for men, and we're trained in a very different way. Um, and it's, we're at odds. You know, men are at odds uh, with their relationship uh, with women, and uh, they don't normally get very good training. So the goddess for me is a universal uh, concept. Mother Earth is, is my primary goddess, Gaia, and uh, I'm here to serve her and I'm here to listen to her, and I'm here to be an advocate and to be in partnership. And it's a high honor to do that. My sister, my oldest sister passed away eight years ago uh, to cancer. The last thing she told me, mm. and I miss her every day. Um, the last thing she told me was, Jonathan, always be thankful. And I think living a life of gratitude for me is the best expression of my worship of the goddess, of my relationship with the goddess. Uh, to always be grateful and to express that as often as I can. It revolutionizes every day when I remember. I don't always remember, uh, but when I do, it revolutionizes my day. That's a long way around that question. And uh -huh. <laughs> so forgive me if I go off on tangents. That was beautiful. I'm so sorry mm -hmm. about your sister. Yeah. Yeah, it was her birthday yesterday. Aww. And one of my nieces, uh, I responded to one of my nieces' posts about that. The last thing Paula said to me um, was, I love you too, Jonathan. Aww. And so um, when I've heard her, since she's passed on, when I've heard her, she has told me, Jonathan, you're going to love it here. <laughs> so she's up there with my grandmas and with my mom who passed on when I was only in my 30s and my grandmas and I firmly believe they're all going to be there to meet me mm, that's beautiful so you were really mm. close to your sister yeah to my sister Paula yeah yeah she taught me a lot mm. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, we can dedicate this, this time to her in her honor of her, of your connection with her and all that she taught you.
Mm. Yeah, I would love that. And for um, for men who didn't have the privilege of being trained uh, by great women in your life, um, go out and get a cat. <laughs> because cats are also great training. Um, it's said of cats that they were worshipped 2,000 years ago in ancient Egypt as gods, and they've never forgotten it. <laughs> that explains so, a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, dogs have owners, cats have staff. And if you want to learn service, just have cats in your life. You're there to serve. <laughs> so true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really I true. <laughs> I love that so much. Yeah. I actually had a, a cat uh, recently pass away. Uh, miss her, miss her a lot, and um, she was a very scared cat. Uh, Some had happened to her the first year of her life, so she was traumatized. But um, over the course of her twelve years, um, I gained her confidence and. Um, Instead of running away at every little sound and and every everything that moved, she ran from. Um, by the end, by the last few years, she cuddled with me and she uh, loved me and I loved her. And um, she actually was a real good lesson for me. Um, Anadea says, still says, if I show some fear about something, some unwarranted fear. Um, that's one of my challenges, being fearful. Um, Anadea says, well, you're pulling another Misty. You're doing another Misty. Because Misty was afraid of everything. And, uh, but she learned, uh, thanks to my love for her and uh, thanks to her trust in me, she learned to be less fearful. And she taught me and was a great reminder for me to give up fear. I think one of the biggest things that gets in all of our way is fears that go, um, I think, unnoticed. You know, uh, we don't discern our fears as often as perhaps we could. And for men, especially, if they're really going to, going to be honest, what's underneath uh, a lot of their biggest challenges is fear. And we're taught to stuff our fears, but um, the only way through fear is through it and not around it. And uh, so Misty and I confronted fears together. And uh, in service of the goddess and of Gaia, I'm in service of all creatures, of people and of animals and of plants. Um, and frankly, if I were to be honest, most days I love animals more than I love people. <laughs> Yeah, I think, I they're, think e they're easier to love. Yeah, yeah, I know. And that, I mean, that, that kind of gets us to, you know, the next question is how and what do you feel and think about the redemption of the feminine spirit and, um, you know, everything that's happened, the history of, of what's happened and where we are now? I mean, what are your thoughts about all of that? Anna Dea, my partner, uh, wrote uh, a great book, The Global Heart Awakens, and she's a much better historian about that than I am. The uh, male-dominated religions took over and destroyed the goddess religions of old, you know, going way back to Sumerian, um, you know, Ishtar. Um, you know, I think I think we're in the throes of a big change. I really believe that. And um, as as uh, Trump and all of his followers and fans go out of power, kicking and screaming, uh, it feels like it's the last vestige or the last gasps of that old um, patriarchal male-dominated order. And uh, you know, so many of us are doing all we can to really be a part of that change. Uh, I'm very active politically in in uh, in the 
in the campaigns now the two senate seats are up in georgia for a re for a recall and a revote uh, this january it's very important that we get those two seats and all that translates into Sorry, honoring my, women my, for oh, me again. I'm in the middle of an interview. No, my children are just <laughs> where this is a hey. real interview, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, who is it? And say hi for me. Yeah, Halifax says hi. Oh, hi, Halifax. Hi, Halifax. Bye, Halifax. <laughs> Shut the door. <laughs> <laughs> so life is what happens thing. when we had other plans, right? <laughs> this is COVID. Everyone's home. <laughs> Uh, the interruptions are the best. Yeah. <laughs> so any, anyway, I think Halifax serves to bring me back on track <laughs> with your question. So am I answering your question? Absolutely. I want your answer, what comes through for you. I mean, I know Anna yeah. Day wrote an incredible book, Global Heart Awakens. And I mean, that's oh. an incredible, incredible piece of work about everything. Yeah we're talking about but i really yeah i want your like what comes from you what your feel you know what your feelings are yeah well i'm kind of a daily and practical man i mean i you know i work with my hands most of the day and so i always go to the practical yeah. and uh yeah. you know i think we need to change leadership obviously and i think joe biden and Kamala Harris being our first female vice president um, is absolutely fabulous. And, uh, you know, I can finally let down my guard that's been up for four years. Wow. And, uh, and, you know, I hope the long nightmare is over. And to anyone listening from other countries, we have been working very, very hard and most of us, by far the majority of us Americans are very, very sorry and very disappointed and very much wanting to get ourselves, our country back on the right track again. And a big part of that is honoring women. You know, the, the conservative um, Trump fans had no problem with Melania Trump you know, having, oh, done, you know, naked pictures, for instance. Um, but they have trouble with um, Joe Biden's wife uh, putting a doctor in front of her name, right, already, calling herself a doctor. They have real problems with that. So this is what we're up against in our country, but it is a minority of this country. It might be 25%, a quarter of this country is like that. Most of us are good, good people that really are, are seeking equality for the genders. And uh, I just, I wanna put a pitch in for us. I want you all to know that. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. That's so important that you're that you're representing that that piece that's a really big piece um you know living in new zealand for almost 20 years i can't tell you how many times you know new zealanders that had never been to america of course just assumed who i was or how i was based on the fact that i'm american and yeah. what they don't understand is how you know how politically like what a mess is going on in America and that the people are really good people, <laughs> you know, really good people. Most so, of us really, really are. Yeah. 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 And you're also from Sweden, like your roots are, are from sweet Sweden. Yeah. It's so amazing well, in Sweden. <laughs> yeah. And, and you and Gray and the boys, live there now i've always wanted to visit and i've never visited so hopefully after covid uh anna day and i can come over yeah. and uh, see you you were such great hosts for us in new zealand oh the generosity and the love that you showed us um 
I'll never forget it. And we want to return the favor, of course, and show you a great time here in California. But Sweden, yeah, it's interesting. My um, great, great, great grandparents were kicked out of Sweden uh, because the state church there is Lutheran. And I was a Lutheran minister. I'm no longer um, a Lutheran minister. But they were kicked out of Sweden because they were Baptists. So they were heretics. And so they came over to America, um, I mean, essentially for religious freedom. Wow. And, uh, you know, they had their own issues as I went back <laughs> into family history because they were very, very fundamentalist. Uh, for instance, I'll never forget um, my grandmother on my father's side, who was 100% sweet. My mother was a little bit Norwegian too, mixed marriage. And that was really a big thing back then when a Swede and a Norwegian got married. But my grandmother was brought up uh, by her parents uh, that it was a sin to play cards, to go to movies, to dance, basically to have a good time, right? And I'll never forget going down to visit her uh, when I was much younger down in this little town of Welch, Minnesota. And I had told her I was coming and she left a note uh, when I got there that, oh, I, I was called away. So I figured, okay, she was called away. She's somewhere in this town. It takes about five minutes to drive through it. And I found her car parked out in front of her friend Millie's house. And I uh, went around to the back, peeked in the window and in the kitchen, there were these four old ladies playing cards. And it was as if you, you, the room could have been filled with smoke and a low hang, hanging light and all visors on. It was, it, it was like they were playing. I mean, they were slapping down the cards. You know, it was like they were playing poker, seriously, right? And so I went in there and, oh, she was so embarrassed because I saw immediately that conservative Baptist, Swedish Baptist background come back um, and she felt guilty. And I, and, you know, I tried to reassure her, no, no you're doing exactly the right thing. You're having a good time with your friends. But I just thought of this just now. Those were four senior goddesses around the table enjoying their friendship and their life together. What could be better than that? What could God and goddess love more than that? And so much of religion, including myself, is getting over the shame that is has been programmed into us. And that's a big part, I think, of, uh, of my calling now is to help people who are transitioning uh, in their religion uh, to get over their shame and uh, to reprogram, to uh, experience and enjoy the gifts of life. Beautiful. Beautiful. So that all came out of you mentioning Sweden. <laughs> yeah, wow. A circuitous route, you know? Yeah, I've been thinking about that so much, Jonathan. I just love the way that was so eloquent in the way that you voiced mm. that, because that's what I've been thinking about in this last week is, you know, because I was trying to find God and I became Christian there for a while too. And it was this whole like disconnection from joy and disconnection from the body and disconnection mm -hmm. from sexuality and sensuality. And like, I remember when I was, I was 15 and I was part of the Christian church in California and I wanted to go to a concert and they said that it was of the devil and that I would be a sinner and like of the devil if I went to this music concert. And I was like, what? <laughs> like, what? <laughs> That doesn't make any sense. Like people are dancing and having fun and like laughing. Like, I don't understand. And yeah, yeah, it's interesting, huh? It's, yeah, it's, um, it's been an interest of mine for a long, long time. I, again, in my upbringing, was very fortunate to be in an evangelical uh, Presbyterian and then a Lutheran church. Now, evangelicals have a very bad name, and for good reason, with how most of them have morphed into this thing that in the United States is very anti-Christ, very anti who Jesus really is. 
But I was fortunate that my parents, for instance, had a wonderful sex life. And us kids were very clear that we were to stay away when they, and they even talked with us about it, not in great detail, but they talked about it as being a gift, you know, from God to be enjoyed. Um, and I was fortunate to grow up in a much more liberal evangelical tradition. So for instance, Martin Luther King, we listened to him. I heard when I was very young, I have a dream speech in Washington, that famous speech of his. And um, it was the civil rights movement in the 60s. And today, again, the Black Lives Matter uh, movement that's driven by the evangelical churches, the black evangelical churches, but the liberal ones, the kind of liberals that um, Jimmy Carter and Rosalind Carter, the ex-president and his wife are, they, he's in his 90s, he still goes out and builds Habitat for Humanity homes. I remember last year or so, he fell and hit his head on a table and he had stitches up here above his brow. And there were pictures of him the very next day with his face all black and blue out there with a, with a uh, drill uh, building Habitat for Humanity homes. That's how he is driven by his very genuine Christian faith. So there's that other side of it that people have gotten right and still get right. And, uh, you know, because of the evangelicals, uh, the conservative ones, Jesus gets a bad rap. But I feel like I've gotten to know the historical Jesus much better since I've been a pastor than when I was a pastor, when I was a minister. And uh, what, what stands out to me is Jesus' interaction with women. I firmly believe that he was influenced by the Eastern religions, particularly the Essene community on the edge of the Dead Sea where the Dead Sea Scrolls came from. And I think he was aware of the goddess religions. In any case, whether he was or not, he honored and respected women. He was revolutionary in his treatment of women in that day and frankly, revolutionary in the treatment of women today, at least in the conservative cultures, especially around the Middle East, the male dominated patriarchal uh, cultures. Um, you know, when, when a woman was brought to him who had been caught in the act of adultery, um, he said that famous line, well, okay, whoever has no sin cast the first stone because they were gonna stone her. And I even did a word study in the Greek of that passage when I was in seminary and the picture of the way it's described there after he said that is the wind went out of their sails. Like all the mob was deflated. And it's just a beautiful picture of how he completely disarmed the entire mob and they all went away and uh, he asks her, where are your accusers when he's alone with her? And she says, well, they've gone. And he says, well, neither do I accuse you. And there's so many examples of Jesus being with the marginalized and uh, being revolutionary in his acceptance of those who, especially women who are on the outside, who were placed on the outside of things. Uh, he was constantly being blamed for being unclean because he hung around with unclean people. Well, and he, his response to that was, well, I came for those who need me most. I mean, that's what, that's what he said. So mm. even Jesus has taught me to honor the goddess. Yeah. He was very respectful of his mom, except for in one case, he got a little perturbed at her for asking him to, I think, make water into wine <laughs> <laughs> at a party. He, he was the life of the party, by the way. He made wine and he told the best stories. There's all kinds of, of, uh, all kinds of uh, accounts like that. But he got a little miffed at his mom for asking him to, 
take care of that problem. He said, uh, woman, it's not my time yet or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Which makes them very real, right? Yeah. Who doesn't get yeah. a little miffed at their mom? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I love that. Yeah. So anyway, I think for you, Shaman, and for me and for other people who have religious backgrounds that did not serve them very well, there's a flip side of that too. You know, it can teach us real compassion uh, for others and a real appreciation. Yeah, it did leave some scars, but those scars can be used um, to uh, elicit more compassion, you know, from I us for like, others. Yeah, I actually had a really good experience with religion for the most part. I mean, there was a few things, you know, like what I just shared, but you know, we we were really poor and we were struggling and it was the church that came and helped. You know, it was the church yeah. that prayed for us. It was the church that um, put food in our in our cupboards when we didn't have any. You know, it was it was a really beautiful experience. Actually, I, I loved I loved my time at the church singing and um, that community aspect and that support. Yeah, that's that's the whole deal right there. Community, yeah. compassionate service yeah. to others. That's for me, that's the bottom line of yeah. authentic, uh, positive religion. It's yeah. not really religion, it's spirituality. You know, it's the yeah. path. It's the sacred path that we're all on. Yeah. Yeah. Compassionate service to others. Yeah. I, I really, I really loved it. And I actually, I, I went back to church when I was in New Zealand and I loved it. I loved it so much all up to the point that they kept trying to save me. And I was like, I'm already saved. I'm good. They're like, <laughs> they're like, but you have tarot cards. I'm like, they're angel cards. They're Doreen Virtue angel <laughs> cards. But they were like, no. <laughs> and then we found a That's place true. in the Bible because we were doing Bible study at my house. And I didn't think anything of it. I had my Oracle cards on the table, my candles, my crystals, my Buddha statues, and they were very worried. <laughs> oh, I was like, oh, yeah, I forgot about all these parts, you know, <laughs> but to me, it's all God, you know? Yeah, to me, to me too. But, you know, I used to, I, I remember thinking that way in my most conservative years, late high school and into my first couple of years of college, I was very kind of fundamentalist thinking that way and very fearful of things that I did not understand. Um, and that's the problem with conservative religion. They have all kinds of rules and formulas, um, you know, very formulaic. And, uh, and when you deviate from those formulas, uh, they get very, um, very fearful. Yeah, I tried uh, to show them, I tried to show them the angel. I was like, they're angels. And they were like, yeah. keep them away from me. I was like, what they're caught they're, they're they have poetry on them and they're about thinking good thoughts and being a good person like yeah. they were like <laughs> you know yeah and i i have a lot of compassion i feel very sorry for people uh, who are stuck that way and part of my um, search now is to make a difference for those people and for for some of them i know in my very own family I have, um, you know, gotten the chip off my shoulder of, you know, see, I told you so, you know, about Trump, you were wrong about him and you're wrong about all this stuff. Um, I don't go there. Uh, see, they need a place to return to when they finally realize how they've been conned. And uh, when they finally realize, like you and I did, that the form of the religion isn't the answer. That's not God. And one of the reasons I'm a mystic is because the mystics say with one voice, uh, the mystics of all the religions say with one voice, the God you think you know is not the God who exists. So these people at some point in their life, maybe not, but I, I'd say most of them at some point in their life will come to a crisis in faith. And we need to be there. Right now, we need to be creating something for them to come over to. Because when I left the church, I was lost, right? I had to create it all on my own. I was lost. Um, but we need to create something for them to come over to 
that's safe and that loves them up and that helps them process these things um, like you and I have done and so many others. And um, I've found some organizations and um, maybe maybe not, I'll form my own. I think you don't should. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Uh, I don't need to reinvent the wheel. When, when you try and go out there and save the world, first find out who's saving it in the way you wanna save it and you know join them. Uh, and if they're not there, then just invent it, save it yourself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So my next question to you is what does the awakening mean to you? Oh. <laughs> I know all my questions are not small. <laughs> no. No, but they're good. See, life's best questions are simple, but they're not easy, right? And the answers are always simple. Your answers are always simple, but they're not always easy. So what first comes up for me with the awakening is to be awakened. You know, the, the old uh, quote, be the change that you wanna see in the world. And it's my responsibility to be an, uh, an awakened individual. My biggest awakened heroes, uh, that I respect the most are people like Mahatma Gandhi and Jesus, uh, Mother Teresa, Nelson Mandela, Rosa Parks, goddesses and gods who awakened thousands or whole countries or whole regions. They all say, when asked, how do I do, how do, I do this? what you're doing. They all say the same thing. Start one person at a time. Gandhi especially said that. He's famous for saying that. Just start one person at a time. If you can't be awakened and awaken your bad neighbor or try, <laughs> you know, people are free to choose. Uh, then nothing's going to happen, right? So I answer your big question with a small answer. Be the small awakened person and awaken as best you can each person you run across each day and do that for the rest of your life. Mm. I kind of don't know how else to do it. Yeah, I love that so much. Uh. Yeah. And I get frustrated, you know, that some days I'm not all too all that effective at it. And other days I hit the mark. I love that. Thank you, Jonathan. That's so true. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Hmm. I've always loved the 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 space that exists between us, you and I. Like there's mm. not a huge amount of people that I'm completely comfortable with complete silence, but it's always been there with you and I, and I love that. I love mm. that there can just be that space just to be. It's really nice. So thank you for that. Yeah. I love everything that you just said, and I love the simplicity of it, like coming back to, you know, we don't have to be the Nelson Mandela, we can do it in our own way, we can awaken that one person. And also like staying awake ourselves, right? When, when yeah. things happen, I know when I get triggered and like today, well, yesterday the ambulance was in front of our house. And um, I immediately thought, oh, God, what's happened to my husband? What's happened to the kids? But it was actually for the neighbor. And oh. yeah, and I asked her if she was OK. And it co come to find out her husband fell. And he hurt his head. And um, he is positive for COVID. Oh. Yeah. 
And so I just found that out right before our call. Um, I ran into her and the drive wow. and, you know, it's like, wow. You know, there, there was a couple emotions that, that ran through, you know, because my husband is it, like, he's immune compromised. So I wanted to like step way back, you know, the, like my instant, like, you know, going into that protection mode. But, but then my heart was like, no, Shema, just, just hold space for her, you know? And she, she looks so scared. I mean, right before Christmas, they're really beautiful people, really kind souls, like just the best neighbors. Like, well, I've always had really good neighbors, but I just love them so much, you know, and I just thought, oh my goodness. So, you know, I was in such a rush to make sure I got the groceries in and the dinner started and then, you know, to come onto the call with you. But I know I was watching and witnessing my own fear come yeah in the way of my own humanity in that moment it's like self-preservation but i mean i stopped myself and i held space for her and i gave her what she needed but it's like i think that's coming up for a lot of people right now with you know yeah. with everything that's that's happening and so my next question to you is like what is your wisdom in how to navigate you know, such difficult times. There's like so much emotion going on, so much happening. I mean, I, I forgive myself for the reaction as well, because here I am alone in Sweden with two kids. And like, of course, I don't want my husband to get COVID. And now the neighbors, you know, has gone down with it. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, right, right. you know, um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm going to cook a meal. I'm going to cook a meal tomorrow and bring it I don't know if I bring it all the way over. I, don't, I haven't. I haven't worked that part out yet. Like, oh, oh. Yeah. Well, we we just had a friend uh, who said he's got COVID now too. Another friend, and that's probably what Anna Day Anna Day and I will do is uh, you know bring him some meals. Uh, he's got a lot of friends, so he'll probably get a lot of love that way. So what I hear, Shamet, what you just said, uh, yes, fear, definitely. And it's a great catch to catch your fear. That's something I am getting better at myself. But I hear something else um, around or behind that fear. And something I really appreciate about the goddess, especially the moms and wives, is how big you all love. You love really, really big. And that's something you and I have in common um, is that we have so much love for people. We don't know where to put it all. You know, we don't know how to express it. It's just so big. And that's what I hear more than your fear, much more. And you are a goddess who loves your husband with a big love and loves your kids and your dog with a big <laughs> love. <laughs> and your neighbors. And uh, that, I, I think there's nothing more beautiful than a mom, for instance, who fiercely loves her children and will defend them till death, right? <laughs> you would absolutely give your life for them. And if anyone threatened them, you might just take them out, right? I mean, that's just, <laughs> that's just your first inclination is just to, okay, you mess with anybody I love, it's, it, you're, it's all over for you, you know? <laughs> I am a bit of a lioness, it's true. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I think that's just a beautiful thing. Um, I've seen that in the wild, you know, on nature shows of, of a lioness just taking on hyenas or taking on a male lion who threatens her cubs. And I just think that's a glorious thing about nature. So don't be too hard on yourself <laughs> with when you catch your fear. Um, you know, one thing I learned about um, our shortcomings, whether it's fear or something else, is um, it's hard to change those things. And I don't focus anymore on trying to change the negatives in my life, whatever they are. Um, I replace them with something positive. And so 
just work on the great love, the great big love. You know, you have just expressed that and, you know, and Jesus said, perfect love casts out all fear, right? Mm -hmm. So, so I've been working on that in terms of letting go of any fear that I have. And I just, I just fill myself with love. I just feel the love. I express the love. Um, and that takes care of virtually anything. Yeah, I mean, my, my natural inclination too. the other side of that is I just wanted to give her a big hug and say, it's good. It's OK. Oh, yeah, she, yeah, was yeah. Like, she was like, nope. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's, I, it's, I was like, oh, it's, poor thing. Yeah, it's, it's so hard. Um, <laughs> in this COVID time, not to have the connections of physical connections and hug our family and friends and everything. And for those of us who are fortunate enough to be with, you know, a husband, a mate, um, kids, uh, I feel so sorry for those who are alone, you know, and, and who are cut off. And I would say to those people, just find all the connections the best way you can. And if you wear masks and gloves and still, you know, hold hands, and even, you know, hug off to the side. Uh, if you feel that that's safe, do whatever you can to uh, to stay connected. And man, when this thing's all over, oh, the hugs we will enjoy. Yeah. And for, for us, you know, this has been so poorly managed by our federal government here for obvious reasons that it'll be at least a year from now, you know, or yeah, a year from now before the vaccines and, and the social distancing and everything takes hold to make it safe enough to hug our friends again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, um, you're having a hard time there in America, but I, I see the numbers are going skyrocketing in Sweden too. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we have to we have to hang in there and um, wear the masks and don't go to you know, social events that are risky, just don't do it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, have compassion for yourself and the people around you. Keep keep us all safe. Yeah. You know, one thing too that came to mind in one of your questions uh, is one thing I've learned living with Anadea. Um, I, I guess I learned it long ago, but it's really coming into focus now is uh, I no longer look at her to make me happy. And with this pandemic, that's one thing I think we can learn at a deeper level is don't look at circumstances and people to make you happy. Um, you know, after I left organized religion, it was Zen Buddhism that really kind of saved me. And, uh, you know, Buddhism teaches you uh, that the source of suffering is your expectations, right? That you think somehow life should be different than it is. And it's really interesting. Life only happens one way, the way it occurs. Yeah. It never happens different than the way it happens. So um, if we expect it to be a different way, especially in this time of COVID when we're facing such very real, real struggles and challenges, but if we expect it to be different, then we just suffer more over it. Um, and in, an, in a relationship with a goddess, in any of our relationships with our family and friends, um, I no longer look for, for instance, Anadea to make me happy. That's my job. That's my responsibility. I'm responsible for me. She's not. Now she does all kinds of incredible things that make me very happy. But, you know, we have our days that aren't always like that. There's just not time, right, to do that um, for the flowers and the notes and, you know, all the things that we try and do for each other. Um, she's not responsible for me. I'm 100% responsible for me and nobody else is. So. In a way, that might be the number one thing I've learned to serve and honor the goddess is to not have an agenda for her, right? To not expect anything from her. 
And um, one of the men that I met in my life that respected the goddess, maybe perhaps who got it more than anyone else I know is Stan Dale. And Stan Dale was the founder of the Human Awareness Institute here in California. He wrote some great books. And, um, and one of the things he said, he said a lot of great things that have been very helpful to me. One of the things he said is, in a relationship, be willing to ask for your 100% and be willing to hear yes or no. Be willing to ask for your 100% all the time. And that is something many of us have never done, is ask for our 100% in our relationship. And if you're a man uh, serving the goddess, one of the things that's easy to overlook is to ask for what you want, right? To ask for what you want. And then give up your agenda and be willing to hear yes or no but to take care of yourself, just in the act of asking life in general for your 100% is taking care of yourself. If she says no, okay, well then I'm responsible to be happy and to make myself happy. If she says yes, well, just got a little easier <laughs> to make <laughs> myself happy, right? And the reverse is true too, at least for a man is, um, one thing that Standale said to men, I remember in a workshop once I took with him, he said, the secret to having a happy relationship, find out what she wants and give it to her. Find out what she wants and give it to her. Now, it really works well if both people in the relationship, you know, whether you're in a heterosexual or uh, same gender, you know, relationship, whatever kind of relationship. If you're both doing that and it goes both ways, it can be, it's transformational. Yeah. Yeah. So for me, that's a very practical, again, I kind of, I'm a practical guy. And if we can just do practical things daily uh, to express things like this, then I mean, even with dating, I learned decades ago when I gave up my agenda, dating went much better. You know, when I gave up my agenda for who I was dating um, and just relaxed, um, I generally got what I wanted. Mm. You know, what, what I needed and what I wanted. But it's so funny when you give up your attachment to things in general, things come to you. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Thank you, John. But that's that, yeah, that's not meaning going passive, of course. You can be very active and very, and go after things, of course. You're just, you give up the agenda on the results having to always look a certain way. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. And so, my last and final question, and in a lot of ways, I think you've answered it, but, um, mm -hmm. If you just had one thing to say to humanity right now, you know, besides everything else that you've said right now, what would it be mm. to, to help people not only live, but thrive during these auspicious times? So I'm going to look, there's no right answer to this, of course. But I'm going to look right into your eyes, right into your heart, right into the camera. And I ask you who are listening to let this go right down into your heart, to the deepest place of you. And I need to hear this every day, too. Lighten up on yourself. Go easy on yourself. You're doing just fine. And it's all going to turn out. When this life is over and we go back to wherever it is we came from, we're going to hear 
you did just fine. You're now in a place where it's all turned out. So love yourself. Lighten up on yourself. Yeah. They say that's enlightenment, right? <laughs> you know, yeah. And here's the thing I've learned from a friend this recently, my best friend, Stuart, who I would say is far more enlightened than I am. <laughs> So he has learned from other enlightened people that whatever we experience as enlightenment is not it. <laughs> <laughs> not it. Because as soon as we experience that profound enlightenment, right? That's the ego experiencing that, mm. right? Mm. And when he told me this, it's like, really? <laughs> really? <laughs> I haven't arrived yet at enlightenment? <laughs> no, you're a long ways away from it. <laughs> <laughs> when you experience that enlightenment, enjoy it. It's fine. It's great. You're a better person for it. That ain't it. <laughs> <laughs> I can so relate to that. Oh my God. Yeah. I know. I remember being, I remember being like 23 and Vipassana meditation for that 10 days. And I finally like, Oh, I thought I had reached enlightenment, you know, and then boom, back in my body. And then I was like trying to get back to that place. And you're right. It was my ego. It was my spiritual ego. Yeah. <laughs> it's so funny, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and I, I, I think for me, my, my learning curve now is to be the best man I can be. And so I'm, I'm uh, relearning my, uh, I'm, I'm claiming my Thor, <laughs> right? The Norse god of storm and lightning and rain and thunder and uh, I mean to be a man's man because uh, I've, I've got all kinds of education in my feminine side but for me it's uh, man to uh, kill bears so to speak I, I, I don't like to kill anything but you know what I mean I mean to really accomplish work and really to build things and to be the best man I can be. And, and guys, know yourself, be, be your best self. And that's what our women want or our male partners want. Uh, be your best to you. Um, so it's almost the reverse of kind of a spiritual enlightenment. It's no, it's grounding to the earth. Yeah, You know, it's, it, that's as big a learning curve and a growth area for me as anything going up to the seventh chakra is being down in the base earth chakra. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Rooting down, down rise, rise, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But any of this that we're talking about, the, the real, um, Breakthrough is beyond words, of course, right? You, you can't say it. Yeah. There no words for it. Hmm. <laughs> well, They're silent. Yeah, that's right. And I, I love the humor that you brought into this interview because to me, all the most enlightened beings that I have met have a really good sense of humor. You know? Oh, ain't that the truth? Yeah. Yeah. When I lose my sense of humor yeah it's all over you know if i have a day, if i have a day without humor i'm good for nothing there was a um there was a zen master in salt lake city where i used to live uh, uh, as part of a zen center who was a riot he was so so funny 
and I respected him so much. He was such an enlightened being, according to me. And and when I told him that, he said, you know, Jonathan, the only difference between you and me is I catch myself a little faster than you do. That's it. That's the only difference. I just, I practiced a little longer. I catch myself a little sooner than you do. That's it. That's the only difference between great spiritual masters and all the rest of us. I love that. I love that so much. I remember when I was younger, you know, if the milk or the yogurt was to come flying out of the fridge, I'd be so angry, you know, I just get so angry and I get so upset, you know, if it, if it just went everywhere. And then, you know, through right. yoga and my meditation and like that practice, you know, that practice, I got to a place where one day the yogurt came flying out of the fridge and yogurt went absolutely everywhere and no one was there <laughs> and I could have and I could have reacted in whatever way I wanted but I just started laughing you know and I thought yay I'm finally you know I'm finally getting it I'm finally getting there but it I mean it took years of practice but you know it doesn't mean that i'm a better person now than i was then it was just that i had done all that practice not to react in one way right. and to respond in another way as in it's not that big of a deal you just clean it up it's really like yogurt funk and milk spills it's how do you right. then cope with it so i think that's yeah the best lessons in life are be because of yogurt and yoga. Yogurt and yoga. <laughs> I didn't even make the connection, but that's funny. <laughs> and we're not always going to get it right. And I think that's what, you know, what you've been saying too. And, you know, what I want to say to everyone out there that's been listening is, you know, some days you're going to be the bug. Some days you're going to be the windshield and just do your best. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's right. Uh, the other day I was taking things way too seriously, way too heavy regarding work because I'm trying to finish a job that's taking longer than it should. Um, and I was, you know, in, in the drolls of that and uh, a little hummingbird came up and landed on a branch uh, just over my head and was just kind of looking around. And uh, the great spirit, uh, the traditions of Lakota Plains Indians people, um, you know, say, listen to the great spirit. When the great spirit sends you a totem animal, sends you something in your life, uh, and the butterfly and, uh, and the hummingbird are light animals. They're telling you if they ever appear to you, they tell, they're telling you lighten up, you know, find your sense of humor again, lighten up go easy on yourself and uh, see the great spirit, the great mystery is always there. Mm. Always there, uh, always has something for us. But you kind of got to take a deep breath and, you know, open up these things <laughs> and shut off this thing <laughs> at least once in a while, if you, uh, you know, a couple times a day. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. you know, uh, you're welcome. Shaman, it's such an honor to be with you and to be with the people that are here listening to this. And I hope I've said something that's helpful. And I really look forward to hearing all, all of the people who are talking on this summit. Thank you so much for doing this. It's a very important work you're doing. You're great. Thank you, Jonathan. You remember how I said that spirit was like pretty much shouting at me saying that you had to be part of the summit. You had to be part of the summit. Yeah. And I just, all, everything that you just said, everything that you just shared was so relevant and so important and so needed to be the voice of the summit, especially the hummingbird at the end. That was for my mom. So, uh, mom, when you hear this, <laughs> in uh, the moment, that what that hummingbird medicine was for you. So, yeah, yeah and, the, and she's gonna know what this means. So, mom, I love you, and this is for you. Jonathan just channeled the hummingbird medicine. Uh, you. <laughs> yeah, I love you too, mom. You're here the best. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for doing such great work with your daughter. 
-hmm. and she's passing it on to her kids. Definitely. Nothing better. There's nothing better than loving, wise, powerful moms. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for loving the goddess, Jonathan, and being so honoring of the goddess. That three weeks that you came and stayed with us in New Zealand, I felt so honored, so cherished, mm -hmm. so seen and loved and cared for by you. And mm -hmm. I love that you uh, honor women in the way that you do and bring that through um, so authentically. And um, I hope that this reaches so many men and in itself is a training <laughs> on yeah, how, well, to, it, how to treat the goddess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, it's, um, you know, I'm fortunate to have been trained by great women. And, uh, but, you know, it's not too late for men who didn't have that kind of classroom. Uh, you know, we all just start where we, where we are. And I look forward to listening to your whole summit and learning um, from the great people you have here. I, re I really do. I can't wait for it. Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. And so everyone that's listening, um, Jonathan is working right now on his website and um, that should be up and running hopefully by the summit. But if not, we will definitely plug in those details too so that you can find Jonathan and his beautiful, beautiful artwork. And um, I mean, I'm, I'm having a strong intuition, Jonathan, that you're gonna be writing some books, that you're gonna be working with men, that you're going to be working with a lot of people in the future. And so there, I feel like there's a lot opening up, like your medicine is really needed in the world and what you have to bring is powerful and healing and needed at this time. So thank you so much for bringing your particular brand of magic to the summit. Yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah, I'm working on a uh, couples and uh, men's uh, workshop right now. So that'll be out sometime oh. next year. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> so yeah. that's cool. <laughs> and I'm redoing my website. Now that'll, that'll be up by the time this airs too. Oh, good. Oh, that makes my heart so happy. You could write a book on like the secrets of how to treat a goddess or something. I don't know. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, Anna Dea, I don't know, she's done nine or 11 books and co-authored books and so forth. And I so, oh, I so respect her for all she's done. All my books, like most of us are right up here. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah so I'm working on getting those out. Oh, good. Great. Yeah, I think the world uh, definitely needs what you have to say. So thank you for agreeing to be on the summit and bringing some of that. Oh, of course. Yeah. Thank you. Great fun. Okay. Mwah. Love you. <laughs> Lots of love.